Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. How are you all doing? Good? <laughs> Not food coma too much, I hope. Cool. So hello. Nice to meet you all. My name is Nicole Ju. Uh, as our lovely introducer just mentioned, I joined Parity Technologies uh, a couple months ago. Um, if you guys aren't aware, Parity Technologies is currently building the Rust implementation of Polkadot along with uh, the Web3 Foundation. Um, there are other implementations of it as well, um, namely one in Go called, called Gossamer by another team. So I was originally drawn to this space um, after working for a while in Silicon Valley and in Indonesia. Uh, I spent the last two years working on emerging market technology in Indonesia and dealing with a lot of the infrastructural issues there. And so a lot of that has motivated um, blockchain solutions. So I decided to join Parity a little while ago as a software engineer. So before um, I segue into uh, the, the topic of our conversation, I wanted to get a general um, gist of the audience and, and who comprises of the audience. So maybe we can do a quick show of hands. Uh, how many of you guys in the audience currently own an Ethereum wallet? That's nearly everyone. That's quite good. Actually, that's about 50%. How many of you guys have written or interacted with a smart contract before? Cool, numbers dwindling down to about 20%. Um, how many of you guys know maybe more than five EVM opcodes? <laughs> nice, <laughs> a good handful of people. How many of you guys, um, in, in, in terms of scalability in, in blockchain, how many of you guys have run a lightning node solution for Bitcoin? Oh, that's a good handful of people, great. <laughs> so for the purposes of this talk, uh, I think we're not getting detailed enough for you guys but I was informed uh, by the conference organizers that we wanted to do first a very high level overview of what is the scalability problem in blockchain, what are some of the solutions that have occurred so far, and from my perspective, how Polkadot fits into that overall ecosystem. So I ask you guys to bear with me on this high level overview and hopefully we can go more into the technical details a little bit later. All right, great. So here is an oversimplified history of scaling solutions for blockchain for you guys. Um, so in 2009, uh, Bitcoin went online with uh, these one megabyte blocks. Um, and each of those blocks could only fit in a certain constrained number of transactions. By design, those blocks, if you guys recall, appended on top of each other with these 10 minute intervals. Um, and so that, of course, placed the ultimate bottleneck on um, throughput. Uh, and we measure it by TPS, transactions per second. By design, with Bitcoin, you also get probabilistic finality, right? Which also means that you had to wait for another 45 minutes to 60 minutes before you're probably sure that your transaction has gone through and is secure and is accepted by the network. So, of course, the network deployed, and in practice, we saw that Bitcoin had an average of four TPS, only four transactions per second. And so people got around to talking about overcoming the scalability issue for Bitcoin. The first tranche, the first family of solutions were, um, I think, what I consider to be really band-aid solutions. It's, it's inspecting the natural attributes of the blockchain and proposing to change simple parameters. Um, like you can see very visually here, um, by simply increasing the block size and you can slot in more transactions. Or um, through a different proposal um, called SegWit, you can decrease the transaction size by taking different attributes of, um, for, for them it was a signature witness that, that, saved, that ended up saving about 70% of, of each transaction space. And through that, you can cram more transactions into each block. So I think a lot of these are band-aid solutions because you get these 2x, 3x optimizations. Right? Uh, yeah. um, and it also comes with trade-offs uh, in terms of decentralization. Because the more um, you increase these block sizes, the more limiting uh, you, you put onto the hardware. Um, so this also means that some guy running a computer in the middle of Kathmandu in Nepal, his computer might not be able to grow with the specs of your network. And so in that sense, you're also um, kind of getting further and further away from the original decentralization ethos of blockchain. With me so far? Yeah? Okay, <laughs> cool. 
Great. So the second family of innovations around scalability came around the insight that not all transactions are created equal. So sending a smart contract to, to confirm a land deed for something that consequential um, is very different than a microtransaction that you would want to send to your friend to pay him or her back for dinner. Um, so that's the thesis behind the fact that, oh, maybe we can take care of some of those less consequential transactions off the chain. Um, we can keep the main chain ongoing with its time uh, limitations, with its latency limitations, um, and use it as a eventual settlement and reconciliation layer. And we can handle our bundle of high throughput transactions off of the main chain. So in this illustration that you see here, this means that, for example, we can handle, say, 20 transactions off of the chain and eventually reconciliate that with the main Bitcoin blockchain or the main Ethereum blockchain with one transaction. So theoretically, this allows us to scale um, in 100x, 1000x magnitudes um, ad infinitum. And some examples of this are the Lightning Network, which proposes to get you up to about 1 million transactions per second through their off-chain transaction computational proposal. Um, and of course, uh, as we'll have the experts on this topic from Raiden Network, which um, introduced one of the first state channel solutions on Ethereum. Cool. Um, the third solution came about the insight the, yeah, so the third solution, sharding, came about the insight that transactions will fundamentally belong to different communities, that inherently transactions will cluster um, according to different use cases. So the example here is your shipping network in Singapore versus your e-commerce marketplace in India versus um, a freelancer ecosystem here in London. Uh, we'll have transactions within our own microcosms, but those transactions might not necessarily make it across to the other cluster. So given that insight, it made sense to also adopt a very traditional database sharding um, concept uh, and, and port that over to blockchain. So here, the idea is that you can have different nodes, i.e. different computing resources, handle different transactions in parallel and achieve that parallelization. So in theory, these transactions are contained in the network and are easy to parallelize. Uh, in practice, it is really difficult. If you guys wanted to see one of the most um, advanced and complicated sharding algorithms that are currently out there, go check out Zillica Network. Those guys have made a lot of interesting progress in the space and will attest to the fact that solving asynchronicity problems, solving transaction um, race conditions is, is a lot more difficult than, than theory would propose. Can you guys hear me okay, given the rain? Okay, all right. Cool. And the list for all of these uh, scaling solutions go on. Cool. And at the end of the day, I think all of the scalability proposals fall on this diagram, which you'll be seeing a lot throughout the course of the next couple of talks, which is the scalability trilemma. How many of you guys have seen this diagram previously? A good handful, cool. I'll walk through quickly what it is. So um, the idea is that every blockchain at the design stage needs to make a distinct trade-off based on its use cases. And for the most part, it could strive to optimize for two out of three nodes, right? So for example, with first generation Bitcoin and Ethereum, we saw that they optimized for scalability and decentralization with the trade-off being scalability. Bitcoin currently handles an average of four transactions per second. Ethereum, last time I checked, was an average of about 16 transactions per second. Right? Compared to industry, Visa, I think, achieves 2,400 transactions per second. Um, and then you have on the other axis of this scaling trilemma, uh, IPFS, which is this decentralized storage solution. For them, they're not handling currency. They're not um, held to the same kind of synchronous standards that you would get when you're transferring Bitcoin from one party to another. And so for them, they've compromised certain aspects of not so much security here, I would say data consistency in that they don't expect transactions to come back in order um, in order to achieve scalability and decentralization. Right. And lastly, on the last access, to give you guys a concrete example, we look at a protocol like EOS, 
which I believe is a delegated, they, they use a consensus mechanism um, that's along the lines of a delegated proof of stake, where all of their token holders participate in a very democratic-like governance structure. They vote their validators into power, and if those folks no longer pr perform their roles, they would vote them out. And so in that sense, you get better scalability and you get better security with your network, but if you're, of course, centralizing the, the power in the hands of just a few. Right. And those examples kind of illustrate at a very high, oversimplified level how this scaling trifecta works. Good so far? All right. Cool. So um, at this point, you guys might have noticed that there are a myriad of solutions that are currently focused on scaling a single chain. At Polkadot, we're betting that every single chain solution we'll have to make a decision and compromise somewhere on the trilemma diagram. And they, there may or may not be a silver bullet solution that uh, addresses all of our concerns and our needs. What we're betting on is at the end of the day, these chains will all need to talk to each other and be interoperable. So while there are so many ideas out there to scale a single chain, we want to scale the entire ecosystem of chains so we posit that Polkadot is aiming to be a network that connects blockchains together. My personal perspective on this is that I think blockchain adoption is super tribal, uh, just given inherent human nature and how we self-organize. Um, and we've kind of seen that play out a little bit. Ethereum is highly democratic and censorship resistant, which is, to be honest, quite a Western notion. And so for a lot of the usability use cases, we see that being built out in the Western hemisphere. But if you look over in Asia, EOS, for example, is the protocol that's getting significant traction there with a completely different concept behind federation and governance and how they control privacy and offer those solutions to you. So I think this is inherently going to happen because of cultural reasons, local marketing advantages, ed, ed, uh, local marketing advantages, and we'll soon see these large metropolises of blockchains that'll pop up around the world. Um, at which point the focus becomes to scale the entire ecosystem. So at Polkadot, our goal is to scale the entire ecosystem. Uh, we aim to build a bridge between Bitcoin, um, Ethereum, Zcash, so that uh, when a Bitcoin user sends a single transaction that could affect a chain um, a uh, list of transactions in every other network that if a single DAP um, in the Ethereum network sends off a transaction, that might trigger something to happen in some private banking network somewhere way off in the world. Cool. I'm getting a note on time, so I wanted to breeze through the end. Um, and so last but not least, as a result of us optimizing for this interoperability, um, Polkadot also inherently enables for infinite scalability. Um, the idea is that if you use Substrate, which is a open source blockchain building framework, and you build a blockchain, deploy it on the Polkadot network, once your blockchain gets enough traction, um, you can horizontally deploy another what we call parachain um, and scale yourselves horizontally ad infinitum. So for those of you who don't know Polkadot, um, I wanted to leave on this note. It's, it's, uh, it's Web3's take on a next generation blockchain protocol. Um, and our key tenants are scalability, governance, and interoperability. Uh, we're aiming for this to be a heterogeneous multi-chain framework that is set to enable independent blockchains to exchange information and transactions in a trust-free manner. And one of the core things that we're going to focus on, um, both as a movement and as a team, is uh, to build bridges that'll link existing other blockchains and compelling use cases, um, not just to Polkadot, but to each other and other networks that are siloed out there that might not otherwise have access to this interoperability. Cool, that's all. I think I'm out of time. So thank you guys for listening. Can you hear me? Yeah, cool. 
So I'm Jacob. I'm just waiting for uh, my slides. But uh, I think uh, Christina already introduced me pretty well. Last time I was in London was, was at DEF CON 1. So that's like three and a half years ago now. And the weather was exactly the same. So I have very good experiences with um, London so far. Yeah, so what we're doing today is an introduction to the Raiden network. I've been working on Raiden for more than three years, actually since DEF CON 1 when we announced it. Um, yeah, so what is Raiden? Um, it was already mentioned by Nicole, but we are kind of the Ethereum version of the Lightning Network. At least that's what we were inspired by uh, originally. Uh, so we are a payment channel network. First of all, what is a payment channel? A payment channel is basically an off-chain state channel between two nodes where they can um, transfer messages between each other and settle on-chain afterwards. And they also open the channel uh, via a smart contract. So we build a network out of this. Um, and I have another slide showing that a bit better soon. Um, but basically, it allows for any ERC-20 token to be uh, exchanged between two counterparties or more. Um, yeah. And so how are we doing any kind of uh, scaling here? We do that by not involving uh, the blockchain for any transaction. We only need the blockchain to open channels and to settle channels later on. So everything that goes on in between this is off-chain and is done just between the nodes that are um, involved in a, in a payment. So what does this mean? It basically means that, first of all, you don't have to pay uh, a gas fee for every uh, transaction you make. And also, it's fast because you don't have to wait for the blockchain all the time. Basically, the speed of your transfers basically just uh, depend on your internet connection speed and your processing power, more or less. But it's, it's not heavy in any way. Um, yeah, so this kind of shows what happens. Um, so we have a smart contract that you, that you use to open a channel. Uh, each node uh, makes a deposit so that you can ensure that you can actually get the tokens back in the end that you're owed. And then we send these balance proofs back and forward. Uh, here we just show that there's a balance proof from A to B and one from B to A. And in the end, when whichever one of the two nodes wants to, to settle a channel, they put this uh, on chain or they put it into a smart contract and this smart contract then understands these balance proofs. And as I mentioned, the really cool thing about Raiden is that you build a network of these nodes and these channels. So any node that's connected to the network can send payments to any other node in the network as, soon as, as long as there is a path with uh, if, uh, enough capacity. And this is the true power of, of Raiden. So basically, you only need to have a couple of channels open, and you can make a, an instant, almost free transfer from one end of the world to the other in no time, paying nothing. Um, so that's the idea of what Raiden does. Now I'll just give some quick updates on where the status of Raiden is at the moment. Um, we launched uh, a release called Red Eyes on the mainnet in December 2018. Um, this is more like a, an early alpha version that we use to run a bug bounty for the smart contracts, but it works on mainnet and um, you can do, uh, right now we're limited to only wrapped ether, but you can do mainnet payments with the Raiden network since December. Um, yeah, I basically described already what, what the functionality of that is, but opening, topping up, channel, topping up channels, uh, settling and closing channels, and then most importantly, doing payments. And then we have a REST API that exposes all this, so it's quite easy to start building applications on top of Raiden already. Um, so the goal now is to improve on Raiden as well as making it super easy to use Raiden, which is what we are trying to do with the API we are building. Uh, furthermore, we also just a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago announced a light client SDK. So with the light client SDK, you're going to be able to do stuff like yeah, Raiden payments on your mobile phone or whatever using one of your favorite uh, mobile wallets. So this is how we see really 
adoption being uh, brought to the radio network. Um, yeah, this I mentioned it before. We want to make it as simple as possible to use or to create payment uh, applications using the radio network. Uh, not important. So what are the next steps? That is Ethaca. That's our next release. And here we aim to bring some services that will make it easier and more secure to use Raiden. For instance, we want to have pathfinding services. These services can <coughs> allow, uh, for instance, a user on the Light Client to ask for a path from his node to any other node in the network and get the path because if you're on your mobile phone, you don't have the full picture of the network since you're not online all the time. We're going to have monitoring services for the same reason. You're not online all the time. Um, and because of this, if your counterparty closes a channel while you're offline, you're not able to provide the balance proof you have. So for this, you have monitoring services that are always online that you pay a small fee to. And then if your counterparty tries to close a channel while you're offline, uh, the monitoring service will close it on your behalf. So this is things that are, these are, these are things that are needed for a light client to work. Other than that, mediation fees. We need mediation fees in order to uh, make it viable or like, make sense to other nodes to actually forward or mediate your payments. But we want to build a model of the fees that just tries to balance out the network. So there can even be negative fees that might uh, incentivize somebody to make other payments in order to balance out um, the capacity of channels. It's a bit complicated, but that's how we try to, to solve this. That was a really quick overview of Raiden. Tried to catch up with some time, but um, hopefully we can talk a bit more about it in the panel. So yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? It's fine. OK, great. Uh, yes, my name is, um, how, OK, I have to wait for the slides. My name is Alex uh, from MetaLabs. Uh, we work on scaling blockchains with zero knowledge proofs. Quick question, how many of you are familiar with zero knowledge proofs? Uh, almost half of the people, that's great. So, uh, But I'm still going to give an intro on what, what it is and how we can use it for scaling. So Nicole gave, gave us a fantastic overview of uh, existing scaling solutions and described the blockchain tree lemma. And as we've seen, most of the solutions are either improving two sides of the, uh, of the tree lemma at expense of, of, of the last one, um, or just just kind of handle it. So m whenever we have a uh, improvement of, um, yeah, I'm I'm just gonna explain like one more technical level why uh, why it's the what what causes the tree lemma. So yeah, I'm from uh, Meta Labs. We're a small uh, research company focused on applying cryptography um, research to solving real blockchain problems, and. Um, this is how blockchain looks from technical perspective. So we have some state. Uh, this is an, uh, an account model which we have in Ethereum. Uh, we have some accounts, some balances. It can be represented by, uh, by a Merkle tree with, with some root Merkle hash. Um, so whenever you have a new block, you change the state of the blockchain, which has to be stored by everyone, and you make a transition to a new uh, new root and new hash. And it's caused by applying a number of transactions. So we pack transactions in blocks. Every block consists of, of a number of transactions. And we have two types of costs for each block. This is the bandwidth, because we need to propagate the block throughout the peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, and for each transaction, we can simplify it. Uh, we, we, can, we can simply say that we have some information about from account to account, what amount we sent, and a big data which causes the, uh, we, a big chunk of data which represents the signature and maybe some other data as well. Uh, and then every transaction has to be verified by the users. So you have to verify that you take some money from the from account, update the state, you have to verify uh, the 
uh, like up update the state for the new account where you send funds, and you have to verify the signature. And the signature verification, or generally, if you have a more complex transaction, execution of this transaction with all the proofs, all the checks, takes a, quite a lot of time. So now imagine that we could replace all the signatures for every transaction, which we can have thousands in a block, with just a very short cryptographic proof that all of them are valid, without you having to verify each individual ones. And similarly, if we can replace the verification of signature and execution of all the transactions with just a very short computation which checks this, the, 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 this proof which you submitted to you, and then you can be sure that all of them were correct. So you can see that we eliminated the, the bulk of all the computations and all the data which we have to uh, transmit over the network, and we can actually do this now with zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, zero-knowledge proofs are a family of cryptographic protocols conceived in uh, actually in 1985, and were, they were developed over the course of the 90s and 2000s, but they only got mature enough now to be able to, for us to use them in blockchains, and the, the protocols simply allow me to prove to you that I have performed some computation on some pub function which we both know, on some public data which are disclosed, and I also have some private inputs which I do not disclose, so we can have a zero-knowledge property, which allows us, for instance, to, to make co uh, confidential transactions. Um, and I can prove it to you succinctly. So we have a few proof systems, such as SNARKs and STARKs, which have this S in front, says succinct or scalable, which means that the computation that you need to perform in order to verify my proof is logarithmically less or like asymptotically less than the amount of computations that you would have to do to just naively execute the function. Uh, and same, same applies to the proof size. So with SNARKs, the proof size are much, much better. Starks are just getting off the ground. They are quite large and probably not very usable for blockchain at the moment or like difficult to use for blockchains. But both can be applied and um, yeah, the, the trade-offs of Snarks is that we have a trusted setup, uh, which uh, you might have heard of with Zcash. We need a multi-party computation ceremony of multiple uh, of many participants, and if, if at least one of them is honest, then the entire ceremony is, is okay, and you cannot fake proofs. And this gives us this massive improvement in, uh, in the proof sizes and scalability. Uh, Starks do not have this, but this is actually a solvable problem. It's just, just pretty difficult logistically, and new proof systems appear almost monthly, so we expect that by the end of year, maybe by the, the end of next year, we'll have something really succinct with the trusted setup problems either solved or practically solved. Uh, so it's really interesting to observe. We're super early now with these protocols, but they finally get tangible to we, we can finally use them to actually build something. And uh, yeah, we, we, we are in Matter Labs, we're building a layer two sidechain technology which will employ zero knowledge proofs for uh, scaling transactions. Uh, it can give us high throughput. Security of these transactions is going to be very similar to security guarantees of their layer one without sacrifice of either user, either scalability or uh, decentralization or security, right? And uh, nodes are not exposing any private keys because everything is cryptographically proven, so you, you just broadcast uh, the data without having security risks on the operator side. Um, we don't have liveness assumption, which is a bit technical. We, we will probably discuss this in the panel. And it's very capital efficient, so unlike plasma or state channels mostly, we don't have any extra capital requirements to run such a sidechain. Um, yes, uh, and, and we can also have censorship resistance properties, so it's a properly decentralized network which can be, cannot be stopped or censored. So thank you, please follow us, it's a really interesting topic and talk to me after the, uh, the panel if you're interested.
Can you hear me? Hello. Hi. Uh, so my name is Sean, and I work at a blockchain company called Flare. And today I'm going to be talking about an open protocol called Interledger, which is used for sending payments across different ledgers or underlying blockchain technologies. So Swift was founded in 1973, and the average transaction size on Swift is $45,000. Visa, by comparison, the average transaction size is $80. The average transaction size today on the Interledger is about one one thousandth of a penny. And why is this an important property? And do we really need payments that are going to be that small? To uh, motivate an answer to this question, I'm going to first go back to how the internet, the original internet, internet came about. And so before the internet came about, we had all this dedicated infrastructure for different communication services, such as phones, telegraphs, pagers, and TVs. And then once we had this consolidation of infrastructure with the internet, we had a single way for all these different services to both interoperate and also to build applications on top of. And the result of this was made it much easier to build services on top of the internet and also just more services to come about preventing uh, vendor lock-in on any of these different previous infrastructure uh, you know, lanes that we used to have. And so the internet was enabled by this TCP IP protocol. And Interledger is the TCP IP protocol for the internet of value. And so what we have today before the internet of value, which is just emerging, is like before, we have these fragmented value networks between, say, corporates, remittances, retails, and banks. And what the interledger is, is just in the same fashion as the open protocol of the internet protocol, we have the interledger protocol, which allows payments to consolidate the infrastructure across all these different services. And so how, how do we design this internet pro interledger protocol to, to facilitate this? And what is, how do we design the internet value then? So to go back then to the internet protocol again, it had four key features. And so the main one was that it was open, open standard. It had uh, the ability to connect disparate networks that were not originally designed to be communicated together, such as Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, underlying copper networks. It was use case agnostic. And then the fourth property is that it had packetized data. And packetized data is a way to send small amounts of data across any type of underlying substrate network and to not rely on the ordering to come through as you sent it and to have an ability to send high volumes of, of data of throughput. And so the difference then for the Interledger protocol is that instead of packetized data, it's packetized money. And we still share the other same properties. And so what is packetized money? And how does it differ from packetized data? So as I said before, the average packet amount of the interledger today is about one one thousandth of a penny. And so a cheap home internet router can process 100,000 to a million packets per second. And this is, a, a, this is a user experience for how it would feel like to use the interledger in the same way that you have an internet service provider that alleges that they're going to give you a certain amount of megabytes bandwidth on your service. You're also going to have interledger service providers where you have a certain payments bandwidth, so dollars per second. And this is an example how you can send a payment where you have some amount of money remaining and you're able to stream using packetized money at a certain payment bandwidth. And the really useful property here, and also the useful property from the packetization of data originally, is that you're, you, you only have a problem of losing a single packet. And so you, in the interledger, your, your counterparty risk is the amount of value in a single packet. And so to motivate why this is a nice, important property, uh, this uh, is a nice analogy from uh, the classic Indiana Jones movie. Um, so in this uh, scenario, this right here is Indiana Jones has a treasure, and he's trying to escape this temple. And there's someone on the other side that is at the exit, but they have the rope that you need to use to, to get out of this, this temple, to cross this ravine. And so the problem here is that 
the person with the rope won't throw the rope across until Indiana Jones throws the treasure. And Indiana Jones is not comfortable to throw the treasure because he doesn't trust the other person that they're going to throw the rope back to them. And so this is, this is the fundamental risk in doing payments or foreign exchange today, is that there's this counterparty risk that you don't trust both sides at the same time. And today we have this all or nothing scenario where you have this, this one person has to go first and uh, whole businesses and in, like industries came about to mitigate risk in this type of situation. And so the interledger way of doing this, solving this problem, is say there's a exchange here between US dollars and Bitcoin between Alice and Bob. What we can do is Alice will send a tiny amount first to Bob, a small enough amount that's economically insignificant, and that if it's lost, if Bob is malicious, Alice just walks away. Doesn't they, Alice chooses the level of money that she's going to send that she's comfortable to send to, to economically become the economically ins insignificant. Bob then goes back and sends another uh, amount of money, and they keep doing this, and they eventually can fulfill an entire payment between each other. And they're only limited by the value that they include in, the si in a single packet, as well as the bandwidth that they have. So we can do millions of transactions on the open internet with no problem, and your counterparty risk, again, is just the size of a single packet. So if you do a you know, dollar per packet at millions of packets per second, you can see that this is not just for very small amounts of payments. Then the other property here is that Interledger also has, like the internet protocol, a, a unified way of handling these payments so that applications that build on top of the Interledger protocol don't have to be concerned with the underlying complexities of these changing ledgers and blockchains that come about in the same way that application developers in the web don't have to be concerned about how Wi-Fi and Bluetooth exactly work. And so we have this homogeneity at this layer at the interledger, which increases the efficiency of the whole system. And this leads to the idea that all payments can be packetized into micropayments eventually. And the result of this is that credit cards and wire transfers will be remembered like faxes. They're not exactly easy to build on top of, to build you know, web systems on top of, and they will likely just go away and be replaced by better systems. And so to recap, we have currently we, these value networks that were disconnected between banks, blockchains, mobile money, and others. And with Interledger, we're connecting them all together and building the internet of value. And uh, welcome everyone to get involved uh, at interledger.org or at Twitter uh, at Interledger. This is an open standard, um, just like the Internet Protocol. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Oh, cool. Do we go back up? Okay. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I'm very excited for this talk, actually, because scalability is one of those very interesting topics. And at the same time, we have a great panel here with a very diverse set of projects tackling this issue from a different point of view. So I think this should, this should shape a very interesting discussion. Um, I want to keep this discussion at a very concrete level and probably start with discussing use cases. Um, actually, Nicole gave a pretty good introduction about the fact that when you design such a solution as a scalability solution, there's sometimes uh, trade-offs that you want to implement. And because of that, um, your solutions might be best suited to specific applications. And I think it would be great to hear from the panelists how, how their own solution is designed, what kind of um, aspects they've really put forward. Is it, for example, privacy? Is it decentralization? And then more concretely, what would be a great example of an application that would benefit most from these design choices? Maybe you want to start with Raiden? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, yeah, so, so for Raiden, we really aim at making payments as simple as possible and 
like very easy to, to program. <coughs> and from the get-go, one of the main ideas for Raiden would be to pay for things as you go. So for instance, pay per second of uh, streaming on Netflix or pay per megabyte of Wi-Fi that you get from somebody else in a park or whatever, like things where you can do a lot of microtransactions to, to, to pay for stuff. Could also be to bribe uh, traffic lights so that you can go faster through the city or whatever. So it's, it's very much like an kind of a internet of, uh, of, of things uh, payment uh, layer. Right, that's, that's great. And actually, so payments is a very big one. I guess for Sean, it's also an interesting aspect. Payments is also pretty big for Interledger. How are you guys addressing this? Yeah, so um, one of the uh, primary use cases of Interledger today is a company called Coil. And uh, they are a streaming platform for uh, monetizing web content on the internet. And they, they allow content creators to have exposure to a different business model that's not based on the typical kind of ad-based revenue model. And so, for example, on Interledger last year, Coil completed over a billion transactions on the Interledger. And so it enables just a, a very nice way for content creators to get exposure to, to getting money. And also then, um, the project that I personally work on, uh, which is an application of Interledger, is called Flare. And Flare is a federated Byzantine Agreement blockchain network. And it's a mouthful, but what that is, is, is a type of style of uh, network that is well suited to high value and compliant use cases. And so Flare is the third federated Byzantine Agreement network after the XRP Ledger and Stellar. And what we do at Flare is we use Interledger to handle node operator remuneration instead of having a native token. So there's, there's no token uh, for me to talk about. And um, then what we, what we do, uh, what, what uh, Flare is then, um, it's just coming out in, uh, now in, in beta. And uh, one of our first use cases is in medical, a medical uh, prescription platform that is built on top of Flare. And it's well suited to getting regulators involved in our network. And so we also contribute to Interledger. So it's a, it's a nice project. Yeah, I can pause it in a bit about Polkadot. Um, it's hard to answer this question for Polkadot because Polkadot is architected to be something what we call a meta protocol. So we don't build it with a specific protocol in mind. Rather, we build it to be evolving. Um, and this is a very opinionated way to architect it as well, I think. So behind the scenes, how it works with our implementation at Parity is um, we built it in Rust. It compiles into this web assembly blob. And that's where we store a lot of the application level logic, the runtime, we call it. And that runtime, uh, represented in a WASM blob, uh, is, is meant to be upgraded over time. So out of the box, you get a lot of use cases, to, to be really specific. Out of the box, you get these modules that will help you handle democracy. You get modules that will help you with different layers of scalability. Um, and the idea is that after a while, if this no longer works, then your people, your token holders, can come in and send in a new technical proposal for how to evolve this ecosystem. And so in that sense, um, Polkadot is a meta protocol in the sense that we're not subscribing to anything concrete um, forever and ever, that it's a protocol that's meant to evolve and grow with the needs of the network and with the needs of the people. So that's one aspect of how to answer this question. Um, the other component of it is, going back to our previous point, Polkadot really just aims to be a network that, com that connects many different um, blockchains together. Our focus there is around letting the teams that are leaning in on their expertise, be it zero knowledge, be it cryptography, be it any other field, to build their domain specific things, lean on their knowledge, and build these individual blockchains that work really well. And the role of Polkadot is to come in and connect those blockchains together. Um, and, and help them scale across each other. So in that sense, Polkadot doesn't subscribe to a very particular use case or a very particular model, but it aims to effectively scale across and enable many, many different permutations. Right, that makes a ton of sense. So that means ins instead of having a given blockchain with a set of compromises, you're thinking ahead and having people being able to provide their own set of, of properties that they need right. for their application, right. and then it's fine, you have multiple ones. And so I guess, Alex, you mentioned in your presentation that with zero knowledge proofs, maybe there is a benefit that you might not need to compromise on anything. And uh, 
Uh, mm. ex 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 yes, exactly. So you you will you always make some trade-offs. So you will always have to compromise something, but not one of the points in the blockchain trilemma. So what you currently compromise with zero knowledge proofs is uh, instant confirmations. So unlike, uh, for example, payment channels, we cannot give you we cannot have transactions off chain which confirm in like zero zero something seconds. You have to wait some time till the proof is generated and we can uh, check it. Uh, but the use case which we, we, we with Meta Labs, we're building a side chain called Franklin Network, uh, which is going to focus on security, on high secure transactions. For example, DEX order settlement. So transactions which transfer a lot of value, which require highest level of security and decentralization at the same time. Because you don't want your users to, like with, if, if DEXs are forced to follow the same procedures as centralized exchanges with KYC, AML, and all the stuff, then they just don't make a lot of sense. Uh, so you will be able to, to, to have properly decentralized exchanges, smart contract platforms. Uh, and on top of it, the biggest promise which zero knowledge technologies offer is of course confidentiality and ability to make transactions completely private where you only share information which is relevant to the participants which you authorized. And do you see this being important for, for example, healthcare applications? I see it important for all applications. Like imagine you just walk out the, the street and you have a badge on top of your head saying like, my net worth is so and so much and here's all the transactions I have and you just make it public completely to, to the entire world. It, it's, it's not feasible, it doesn't make any sense. So you, you, neither for businesses nor for individuals, you cannot have all this information completely transparent and this is currently the, the case on blockchains. So this is going to change, this must change. Interesting, yeah, I think that's quite relevant also to the previous panel on identity and, and many, many things more. So okay, great. I guess moving on from the applications, obviously uh, there's a bit of technical challenges with scalability. I think, Jacob, you were mentioning that in 2015 you were here for the first Ethereum developer conference. And I think that was already a major topic of discussion, scalability. So now we're four years later, and there's been a lot of improvement, but obviously it's not solved yet. So I want to I wanna get some insights from the panelists, given that they spent a lot of time on this problem. Is it because it's not feasible? Probably not. Is it because the technology is just getting there and we need a lot more testing before we're comfortable releasing it to the public with billions of assets on and secured by those technologies? So how are we getting there and, and what's left to be done? It'd be great to get your insights, all of you. Yeah, I can, I can start because we've definitely been on our way for, for some time. I think uh, for us it's, it's two things. First of all, it's we're building something that nobody built before. We, like in the Ethereum space, we were some of the first ones to do something like state channels. So there's just a lot of, of research and a lot of lessons to be learned uh, to start out with. And secondly, it's also the fact of having the responsibility of a protocol that holds other people's funds. Like we've seen a couple of times where things went wrong on the Ethereum blockchain and a lot of funds have been locked up somewhere. And that is the last thing that anybody wants to do. So we would rather push a release months back in order to feel confident rather than push something out and maybe uh, lose people's funds. So that's for us what really a couple of times pushed us back. Right, so it's really giving yourself time for testing those things out. Yeah. yeah. Okay, got it. Got it. And I guess moving on to like the zero knowledge proofs, I guess maybe that's even the the leading edge of the technology is a very recent uh, technology, or not necessarily recent in terms of when it's being applied. But um, yeah, I'm keen to understand from your point of view, I was seeing in the past couple of months, there were some breakthrough discovery that allowed you from Allo Labs to get some uh, 500 transactions per second, things like this. So it'd be great to get your insight on that technology. So we're uh, using technology which has already been tested in production right now, the, the, at least the, the mathematical, the cryptographic basis on which we are currently building is uh, Growth16, which is uh, a proof system used for Zcash, for example, where we see millions of dollars worth of value being secured by this. Uh, and we, we also had, um, with Zcash, the first version of the protocol had bug in the description in the white paper of the scientific paper, which they then fixed. Uh, obviously, you will have bugs with any kind of implementation, and what you want is something which have been in, in production for a long time, 
with a lot of money attached to it as a bounty. And with gradually, over time, people get more and more confident. You have it with any technology. You have it with, with steam engines and trains and planes and everything. And of course, you, you also have accidents. And they can be tragic. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you have to stop innovating. Because eventually, over time, everything just gets better and more secure. I guess just jumping the order, maybe get some point from, from Nicole. Because again, Polkadot is preparing and not necessarily betting on any single technology and allowing every single technology to be used in Polkadot. But it, given that you work in this space, it'd be great to get your insight on uh, where things are going and, and what's missing for, for this to really take off. Sure. Um, I think we've been quite on time with the originally posited two-year roadmap uh, about a year and a half ago. So, so far we have four test nets that are up and running. Um, on the topic of scalability, I think our biggest demonstrations, our biggest proof of concepts, um, namely our consensus algorithm, uh, which is actually split. We use a hybrid consensus algorithm called Grandpa, and then the block finality gadget is called Babe. Grandpa is our um, ghost-based uh, block verification algorithm. So, so that has been out and has been testing with two of our previous test nets. Um, and then on the use case application layer front, uh, we've built certain modules um, that come out of the box for teams that want to use it. Um, and you can choose to turn it off if you want, that are closer to layer two scaling solutions. So obviously those runtimes haven't been tested yet and we hope to do so with the launch of our next testnet given end time period. Um, but in general, um, I think the biggest and the hardest pieces Gav and the technical team have tackled, and we've been um, we've we've put those pieces out there to test for a while, and we should be on time for our mainnet launch later this year. Awesome! Yeah, great stuff. Cool. Yeah, and and, and uh, speaking imagine. about Interledger, um, it's quite it's a mature protocol now. It's been worked on for several years now, and it's currently on its fourth generation of release, and uh, so it has now also been standardized by the W3C just like the original internet protocol was. And so it is here today, and it's working perfectly. So it's quite an exciting movement. Um, and uh, so I guess speaking about my own project, Flare, we are currently in beta, and we're getting traction, and it's going quite well, and we're just growing. There's, there's a lot of people and businesses that are uncomfortable with the move to proof of stake. And so we are an alternative to that, and is another way to scale for very high value businesses. Okay, understood. So the last thing I wanted to mention is around developer experience. So I think it's quite clear that scalability is needed to be solved if we ever want to get wide adoption. But at the same time, adoption is not necessarily going to come just because we have scalability. So another element is making sure that people use this technology and find it easy to develop that. Um, so I wanted to understand how are you guys tackling this to make sure that people want to develop on your own solution. And I think a great one to start is probably Polkadot with the work you guys have been doing with Substrate. So it'd be great to hear from you. Sure, um, maybe a quick history on the evolution of Substrate and what it is. Um, throughout the journey of building Polkadot, um, the development team found that they had to build a lot of things from scratch and that they had to simultaneously be an expert in a lot of different technical fields. And that's kind of been the case for the past four to five years, right? Where to build a single blockchain, you need to recruit a single secure viable blockchain. You need to recruit a team of at least 10 highly competent engineers in all engineering disciplines from algorithms to cryptography to networking to security. And that's a lot of up cost and that doesn't give those development teams too much time to focus either on driving adoption hashing out their use cases or doubling down on their zero knowledge expertise and so while we were building Polkadot, that was the one realization we had which is what inspired substrate so substrate is about 80 percent of the code that building any blockchain takes um, and Substrate is right now a open source, free to use blockchain building framework that any developer out there in the world can take. And within a matter of six minutes to a couple of days or weeks, depending on what the complexity of what you're trying to deploy is, but within anything from six seconds, six minutes to a couple of weeks, you can deploy a fully fledged blockchain. 
um, and you get a lot of things out of the box. You get governance out of the box, you get treasury, which is this concept of how the chain will grow with inflation and you can pay contributors back into the ecosystem. You get council, you get the ability to make um, referendum and proposals to upgrade the blockchain. You get this embedded account-based ledger model that automatically gives every user of your blockchain an account, some balances, and you get all of these crypto economic notions for free. And if you don't like a particular aspect of it, say you don't like the way that we do, we handle our hybrid consensus, you can swap that out for your own preferred consensus mechanism. If you don't like the way that we handle our networking, you can swap out our Rust libp2p implementation for your own invention. Um, if you don't like the fact that we use the account-based ledger model, you can swap out that module and go back to UTXO or invent something that's completely your own. So kind of tying everything back to the whole concept of scalability, interoperability, a huge part of it is doing as much of the non-rewarding work for the ecosystem as possible, and then putting out there this framework that's open source and free to use so that these external teams can focus on what it is they do best, deploy their own fully fledged impressive blockchains, and when they're ready, either opt in to join the Polkadot network or not, and, and remain kind of their siloed private blockchain. And so that was the ethos behind building Substrate. Um, I don't know if we have any Rust developers or spying Rust devs in the audience, but that was the language we chose to go with. Um, and, and I think it's something that'll really pay off in a couple of years. So, so definitely check us out. I think it's substrate parity.dev or just Google Substrate and we're always looking for open source contributors and to give those people resources and help along the way. At Flare, uh, we're quite complimentary to that idea and <laughs> we focused on the consensus module side and we're very opinionated about how we deal with that and how we deal with node operators being remunerated and so yeah, we're definitely very uh, open to making sure that we can have any uh, application side system that can plug in on top of our consensus module. And so definitely we, we want to be compatible with uh, different options such as Substrate. So the great thing about the uh, scaling solution based on zero knowledge proofs, at least what we're building, is we're not using a consensus. We're not building our own consensus. We rely on existing consensus mechanisms and uh, existing um, layer one blockchains. So that makes the developer experience uh, it's ma it makes it much easier for us to provide APIs and blocks uh, for uh, e uh, for our users um, without going into all the complexities. Uh, but I have a suggestion, Nicole, for you. Like we also use Rust. It's all written in Rust, and Rust is, is probably the best language I worked with in terms of yeah. security and performance, and all the like. Not only the security of the language, uh, but also the all the compile, compiler checks which, which are being done, which is like absolutely fantastic. Uh, the error messages are terrible. And like, if you can contribute maybe to also improving Rust itself, that, that would be fantastic. I think we already so are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but apart from that, uh, yeah, we're just going to offer some very lightweight uh, blocks for users to, to, to implement. And I guess we have from Radon's point of view, I know there's a couple of applications live already. So yeah, we, we um, so from the get-go, it was very important for us to have a, a very easy to use API that just exposes the functionality of Radon because we see ourselves as a technology that people build on top. And we also recently changed actually for future versions. We will not use Kekak 256, but we will actually go back to using SHA-3 because that will make it more interoperable with other um, projects, basically. That was a, a wish from some other projects. But yeah, we have some projects already uh, working on building on top of Raiden, um, uh, which is which is nice and, and shows that uh, an easy to use API is, is, is a good thing to have. And just quick advertisement. I'm tonight actually doing a, a meetup here in, in London for Raiden uh, or workshop. So if you're interested in learning more uh, on how it works, you can drop by. You can probably find it on Eventbrite, I think searching for Raiden, just if you're interested. Great, I think with this weather, there's nothing better to do than learning about Raiden, to be fair. So great, okay. I have a couple more questions, but I think it would be a good time to get also a question from the audience, if there is any. So if you have any question, please raise your hand, and we'll get you a mic. I mean, any, any question is fair, fair play. There's no controversial, there's no, there's no silly question, especially around scalability, uh, as long as it's respectful, of course. Uh, this question is for Sean. I think you mentioned before that um, 
Yeah, so you're, you're very opinionated on the consensus mechanisms, right? And right. I think you said you had some clients or, or one of that were sort of worried about moving over from proof of stake and that's why you were an alternative in that sort of case. Um, can you give some more sort of concrete examples about what clients are concerned about when it comes to comparing proof of stake to other consensus mechanisms? Sure. Uh, so there's the primary concern is this idea of like an asymmetric allocation of capital, which is how the financial world operates today. You know, financial institutions are able to put up a small amount of money to secure their infrastructure and also then to rely on laws around the world to, you know, get against, to have a recourse against problems that occur on these networks. And they're all under, they, all the parties that are involved in the Federated Byzantine Agreement Network are known and they are, you know, typically going to be you know, re potentially regulators and businesses that depend on the network itself. And you can only get into power in the network if more parties start including you and trusting you in, in the system. And so it just has a nice property that mirrors very closely about how relationships are actually occurring today in the financial world. And it's not to say that we don't think there's any use for proof of stake. It's, it's primarily just this point about this allocation of capital and knowing exactly who's in control of the network at any given time to always have legal recourse for, for anything. Yeah, I guess this proof of stake question is a very interesting one because a lot of protocols that we that we like um, are are betting on proof of stake working in the future, and I guess to some extent it's still an unknown. I mean, intuitively it feels like aligning incentives through um, through people putting money at stake sounds like it's going to work, but we will see. I mean, uh, outside of Interledger, all the projects here are using proof of stake, if I'm not mistaken. And, and we shall see. I, I'm very optimistic, obviously, because as always in life, uh, incentives usually drive everything. And especially even in proof of work, people are investing into hardware and they don't want to ruin that investment. So intuitively, it's going to be the same with proof of stake, but time will tell. So it's a very interesting topic indeed. Um, any, any final question from the audience? Oh, yeah. Um, quick question. So there's multiple scaling solutions on top of Ethereum. Do you see ultimately it's going to be a winner-takes-all scenario, or do you think there's going to be m more than one scaling solution out there, and how will they kind of all work together? So, yeah. I c so for from from my perspective, I think there will definitely be many different um, solutions. Uh, right now, I think there's like at least a handful of just payment channel solutions being worked on and hopefully we, we can learn from each other's mistakes and at some point arrive at a standard or an interface that we all apply to or obey to, sorry. Um, and for s stuff like uh, plasma or sharding, I don't see a uh, working plasma chain as something that means that payment channels, for instance, or generalized state channels are obsolete. So I, I definitely see um, benefits from having all of it combined. From uh, Interledger's point of view, um, it's, we're definitely very happy for you know, underlying systems to improve and get faster and have a, a diversification in the ecosystem on the underlying systems because the Interledger protocol just can, can plug into literally any underlying system that you can send money with. And so we definitely see not it being a winner-take-all scenario in that case. And Interledger will rely on these underlying systems to be there to, to actually to be used to, at the Interledger layer. And so Interledger is, is a nice way for application developers to plug into these systems and allow them to change and improve over time. Maybe Alex, you want to say something? Because you're also on Ethereum. Um, I yes, I, I think that there is certainly a space for different protocols, especially for different use cases. So we, of course, Within one use case, it's very natural that some solution, like we always have the power law where some solutions will be like most used by people and then it, they tend to accumulate like all the users and we we see the situations of winner takes it all in, in, in many, many um, areas. So I think per use case, it can happen. Between different use cases which serve entirely different purposes, I think we will have uh, diversity of the different solutions. Yeah, indeed, and then even you can start combining different solutions together to have even more more scalability overall. So I think it's very exciting space. Great. So yeah, to to wrap this up, I think globally we can uh, we can conclude that scalability is not an easy thing to solve, but at the same time there's multiple projects solving this from multiple angles. So there's 
every reason in the world to be optimistic. At the same time, it's not going to be solved in one day. Um, but this research has been going on for several years, and I think we are slowly getting there. So I don't want to say next year is going to be over and not a topic discussed at the next COGEX. But in five years, you've got the Olympic Games in Paris. I think by that time, we will not talk about scalability anymore, and it will be something that's pretty solved by then. So no, thank you very much to all the panelists. I just uh, have one question to Sean. Oh, you do? Okay, yes. let's go. So what happened to Indiana and John in at this <laughs> episode? Um, I actually forget. I honestly forgot. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll uh, I want to give credit to actually to Dan Robinson for that comic. Uh, he, he did this in another talk that I saw uh, called uh, HTLC is Considered Harmful. I highly recommend it. It's on YouTube. <laughs> I haven't seen Indiana Jones in years, so sorry to... <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a warning to everybody. Oh, so thank you very Don't much. Don't trust, verify. Big round of applause, everyone. Cheers. Thank you.